20% off homebrew ingredients. That's right. During the month of April, Desiree and Dave of HighGravityBrew.com are offering 20% off all homebrew ingredients to Basic Brewing Radio listeners. You know HighGravityBrew.com is the place to go to take the pain out of propane with awesome electric brewing systems, but they've also got an incredible inventory of ingredients to make your next beer amazing. Just use the promo code BBAPRIL2021. That's BBAPRIL2021. And it's not case sensitive at highgravitybrew.com. And you can save 20% off your homebrew ingredient order. Use the fun and easy build your own beer feature on highgravitybrew.com and enter the promo code BBAPRIL2021 during the month of April and save 20% at family owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. That's highgravitybrew.com. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Jake Gorton, home mead maker and brew house manager at a certain Vermont meadery that you may be familiar with, talks about making wild meads, meads made with microbes already in unpasteurized honey or harvested from the environment. Jake will talk about five techniques he uses to make delicious untamed meads. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Let's go straight into the mailbag. Listener Tony wrote in after hearing Johannes Farenkrug talk about sous vide mashing in a Ziploc bag a few weeks ago. Tony says, Loved Johannes's method so much, I was buying Ziploc bags while finishing the show and mashed in two bags that very night. Really clever method, especially for the small batches that I prefer. But Tony says, he seems to be a, at least a little bit of a sadistic man, though, and it sure looks like you aided and abetted. There was a minor comment in passing about keeping the grains out of the seal. I think you edited heavily to remove the raucous laughter which must have ensued. I tell you, handling a gallon bag full of hot strike water and grain on the counter is not easy nor neat. <laughs> Tony says, once the seal gets warm... It won't zip worth a darn, and the bag rolls all over the place. Grains go everywhere. The seal just gets hotter, and now it's got stuff in it. It's like playing hockey with a cooked spaghetti hockey stick on a busy freeway with molten lava pucks. <laughs> Tony says, I did manage it, but lesson learned, don't trust James or Johannes. Next time the bag of grain goes on a mixing bowl, the water goes in, and the zipper zipped. No more cussing. Spilling or scalding. <laughs> well, I shared Tony's tale of woe with Johannes, and he said, uh, Thanks so much for your feedback, and I'm so sorry for your less than stellar first experience. I do love the spaghetti hockey stick analogy, though. That's very fitting. <laughs> Johannes says, uh, I should have mentioned on the show that you should place the bag in a bowl when you add the strike water. I'm sorry about that. I've written up a little article with more pictures. And then Johannes uh, posted the link uh, to the uh, uh, the story he wrote on Medium. Uh, he says, the first picture, you notice that I've placed the Ziploc bag into a bowl, which will keep it from falling over. And Johannes says, I've mostly switched to using two and a half gallon Ziploc bags. I use the Hefty brand. They give you much more space to work with and preserve your sanity. <laughs> If you uh, want to read Johannes's article, check his uh, Twitter feed for the link to that uh, story on Medium.com. And uh, you can find Johannes at J. Farenkrug. That's J-F-A-H-R-E-N-K-R-U-G. <laughs> it's good Tony has a good sense of humor, uh, at least in the, in the post-spillage world. <laughs> Uh, hey, if you follow our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast on the social media, 
You'll see things are progressing well at their East, lo- uh, East Coast location uh, in Philadelphia. And their seasonal yeast available through the month of May is L09 Cape Bueno. Cape Bueno is said to be appropriate for creating refreshing light to dark lagers with clean, low ester aromatic profiles and crisp and dry finishes. Great for a wide variety of styles. And I can attest that this is accurate. My Mexican inspired, uh, inspired lager uh, is in the keg and it's going fast. Because it's really easy drinking. It started out at around 10.50, and I pitched it uh, in my basement, which was at 59 degrees, uh, for about around 58 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or 14C. And three days later, it was pretty much done and already dropping like a rock. So I took it upstairs to, to warm it up for a diacetyl rest and swirled it back up into a suspension uh, but I don't need, I don't know if it, that was really needed at all. I didn't taste it, but I didn't te- detect any buttery notes coming out of the airlock. Um, but with lagers, you know, better safe than sorry, and you might as well. So anyway, I kegged four days after that, and it's perfect for the warmer weather. Uh, ask your local homebrew store about Imperial Organic Yeast and L09 K Bueno, available through the month of May, with a pitch rate of 200 billion cells, my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five gallon batches, even lagers. Imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. Okay, let's talk to Jake Gorton about making wild meads. Jake Gorton, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me, James. Great to be here. Yeah, well, uh, uh, you, uh, you, we have to disclose that you work at one of our major sponsors. <laughs> what I do, you, do. What do you do at uh, Grow and Fell and Havoc? Yeah, so I'm the packaging director there and also the brew house manager. Um, so I oversee our canning and bottling operations as well as uh, just sort of managing people throughout the day, setting the schedule, uh, you know, making plans for what we're going to do and, and that sort of thing. So, I can imagine that that working with Ricky especially uh, can be. Uh, it, it, he's an energetic guy. It seems like he's a bundle of <laughs> of energy, and it seems like Kelly is kind of the counterbalance of that. It, have I got that picture right? Yeah, you have that completely correct, and uh, <laughs> it's great because they both bring such a fun energy. But what's really fun is Kelly is just hysterical. She's like one of the nicest and funniest people you'll meet, but Ricky's really the out outward, you know, entertaining one. So you've got Ricky there cracking jokes and whatever. And Kelly's got like the little one liners that just really make working there <laughs> super enjoyable. So it's a blast. We have such a great, uh, such a great dynamic. Well, excellent. So what's your history of, of making meads and, and how did you, how did you get to where you are? Uh, that's a, that's a great question. So I, Uh, I went to the University of Vermont and I studied community development and applied economics. And so, you know, there's a lot of sort of economics classes as well as um, ecology, environment, stuff like that. Um, But I wasn't really required to do any hardcore sciences. I was, however, required to do a science. And so I was a little bit stressed out and going like, oh, geez, I'm going to have to struggle my way through chem or I'm going to have to struggle my way through bio and stuff like that and it just so happened one day i was eating lunch and uh an acquaintance told me about a class that uvm offers called what's brewing in food science and i was like oh cool like let's check that out i had at that point you know in in high school and stuff i was making ginger uh ginger beers with ginger bugs and sauerkraut and stuff like that so fermentation was something i had dabbled in before and yeah i just wanted to check it out and um, the way that I sort of learn is through podcasts and stuff. So I ended up looking up brewing podcasts and, and coming across your podcast uh. <laughs> and getting a lot of background information on that. You know, I would be driving somewhere or I was at work and I was just kind of like listening to basic brewing, uh, brewlosophy, stuff like that. And then through you, I learned about Grunfell through one of your interviews with Ricky. And I went like, Hey, that's a town over from me. Like, that's really cool. And at the time I was still 20. So I was doing a lot of research on it and, and checking out meads and, you know, 
I did have somebody buy me one when I was 20 and I would just kind of taste it, you know, very responsible. But uh, yeah, that, that's where I found out about meads. And Ricky actually ended up coming and, and teaching a, a lecture at the end of that class. So I met him there and ended up doing an internship at Grunfell and the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. So, so it's, yeah, a, a little long winding story there that got me where I am. No, I love I love to hear uh, I love to hear people tell you know where where they got the quote unquote bug to to brew and you know how their track on on where it's led them. So that's fun that that, that you know that we kind of cross paths virtually there for yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And it was great because I was learning things in the class and at that time you, there was no lab component to it so you weren't actually brewing um now there is but uh i was i was basically like learning these things relearning them with you being like okay this is kind of making sense i'm hearing more of like the lingo of how people talk about it and then i was trying like all grain brewing right off the bat and really could kind of struggling but had those two back uh, background pieces to kind of put the put everything together. Well, hopefully we didn't lead you too astray. <laughs> <laughs> no, I made all of the, I made all the beginner mistakes myself. Like I dropped my hydrometer into the bucket. And so oh. I got all those little like metal. Yeah. I don't even know if they're lead, but all those little ball, I was like, I got to dump that. You know, it was just it, all my own stupid mistakes. Yeah. I've dropped several hydrometers and they're never fun to clean up because the vacuum cleaner won't pick up those little lead pellets. Or at least our vacuum yeah, cleaner. Yeah, the worst. <laughs> so uh, here's a tip: either masking tape or duct tape. Uh, you know, we'll we'll pick those uh, those little pellets up. So that's just a. Oh, I thought you were telling me uh, to use masking or duct tape to just tape it back together. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been that desperate. <laughs> I was like, hmm, James, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ignore that piece of advice. <laughs> So were you, so you wrote me an email uh, saying talking about wild meads and I you know we've spent some time a bunch of time talking about uh, wild beers uh, you know beers made with uh, you know sort of wild natural bugs that are floating around in the air uh, and make their way way into our unfermented worts but I I can't remember talking about quote unquote spontaneously fermented meads. So how how long have you been yeah. into into this? Well, so I like I said, I kind of got interested in fermentation and therefore brewing through, uh, you know, natural ferments. I guess so, like ginger bugs and sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I just I really think that it's so cool that there's all these little bugs out there that'll do these amazing things for you. So, um, you know, when I started learning about making beer and stuff, I got interested in sour beer um but i was also a little bit of like a impatient person i was like i don't really want to you know start this six month year long project um and then you know i just i just got into mead for a while and then recently i discovered natural wine and uh just started thinking like huh like this is really cool i i have background you know and knowledge with sour beers and then there's this whole other world of natural wine like and cider you know, let, let's give it a shot with mead. I can, can't think of a ton of people who are doing it. Um, there's a couple of producers, like uh, one in, in our state, Fable, has a really nice, they do a birch sap and sumac wild mead. Hmm. And then Enlightenment Wines does some in New York, but I, I'd never gotten the chance to try one. So I was like, let's make it. Now, the, the with, uh, with wines and ciders, uh, there's natural yeast, on the skins of the fruit with honey is there say unpasteurized honey uh are there there organisms in the honey that are waiting there for the proper uh, starting gravity to get to work I, I understand that that the sugar content in honey itself uh is a sort of antibacterial element uh, when you dilute just raw unpasteurized honey down could you could you just start a mead from that yeah absolutely so um there's actually i've kind of taken uh the route of dividing the different ways of making a wild mead um into five different categories and three of those involve essentially diluting honey 
enough so that it ferments. Huh. And honey is basically considered stable around uh, 18, 17 to 18% uh, water, which is where you'll find most of your honeys. But if you bump that up over the threshold of like 18 to 20%, you can start to see fermentation. Huh. And it'll it'll take a really long time, but as long as you're using raw honey, uh, there's there's loads of wild yeasts and bacteria that are ready to just go to town. So what you convert that into uh, specific gravity and and bricks? What are we talking about? Oh boy, um, <laughs> <laughs> off your hydrometer would be my assumption. You'd need a specific like a honey hydrometer. Oh, um, at that point you're really you're taking, you know, honey and diluting it down to the sort of fluidity of maple syrup. So it's still super duper thick. It's still a syrup, um, but it's just got enough water that the yeasts are like, okay, I've, I've got enough to work with here. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it, I, I usually just weigh a certain amount of honey. I do the calculation to take, you know, the, the percentage of water up from 18 to about 20 to 25%, um, which is where I've seen a good amount of success. Wow. And how long does it take for the for the uh for the natural yeast in the honey uh, to get going? Does it depend on the honey? <laughs> uh yeah, so I find it like it depends on the method you're taking. If you're doing that method, I it took about a month for me to see activity. Hmm. And I had talked to I have a couple friends who are beekeepers and you know, they've said, you know, this is kind of considered an inferior product in, in, in the world of beekeeping and in honey, when you get that really liquidy honey. Um, and so they're kind of trying to figure out what to do with it. And I'm like, Oh, cool. That's like, it's going to ferment. Like, let's see what happens. Um, but yeah, it, it takes about a month to see things going and people have pitched brewer's yeast or, or wine yeast into it to try to kickstart things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I basically would mix it together in a jar, stick it in my closet, forget about it. And then a month later, go back and be like, oh, boy, like, you got to relieve some pressure here. We're going to have a problem. <laughs> so you're essentially <laughs> making uh, number one on your list is a honey based yeast starter. Is that what you're talking about? Making a very small batch of this just diluted honey uh, to naturally start fermenting and then, you know, adding that to a larger batch. So uh, I'm kind of I'm describing what I'm calling like the pre fermented honey starter. For me, a honey starter is, well, I guess, can I go over just like how I make a starter in the first place? And then we can apply that to the different methods. Yeah, I may, I may be derailing your uh, <laughs> your train of thought. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, take us through, how do you want to, how do you want to take us through this, this, uh, the different processes? Uh, you know, just start it, teach the class, Jake. <laughs> Don't let me get in your way. <laughs> yeah, um, so... I'll just, I guess I'll start with like making a starter or like how I start with making a starter because most of the methods you can kind of take this and then you're adding something else to it to get to the finished product or method. Um, and so basically it's a pint of water, 16 ounces of water into which I dissolve 80 grams of DME and boil for five minutes. Once it's cooled, I add about 65 mils of vodka and then four drops of 88% uh, lactic acid. And this is kind of just giving you an environment that's going to be really beneficial to yeast and really um, it's not going to encourage growth of a lot of like enteric bacteria um, or oxidative yeast, things that you may not want in your starter because adding the vodka get, already gives you some alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, adding the lactic acid drops your pH below 4.5. So you don't have to worry about a lot of those things that could make you sick. Um, and having alcohol and still some residual sugar allows you to select for highly fermentative yeast. So things that could ferment up to 10 or 12% like you may want in a mead. Hmm. Um, and so that's just kind of, that's the basic starter method that I use in that is developed from uh, Brian Height at Sui Generis Brewing. He's got a lot of cool videos out there on YouTube about uh, wild yeast and wild yeast starters. And so that's kind of the method that I've taken. And then with that starter, you can apply it to the different methods that I have kind of laid out. The first of which being a honey starter. So a honey starter, 
differs from what we were talking about, the pre-fermented honey, in that you're just adding a little bit of honey to this starter. So instead of adding DME, I'm adding honey and I'm giving the yeast a little bit of sugar. I'm giving them, um, you know, that environment that they like. And in that case, I'm not boiling. So right. I just want to, that's where it differs from, you know, making a sort of straight up starter that you could use to make beer or mead. Um, you don't want to kill those yeasts. So it's the same process as you described before, uh, but instead of the dry malt extract, uh, you put you add the same amount of honey and you don't boil, obviously, because you don't want to kill the, <laughs> the organisms yeah. you're trying to culture. If you're not using, you know, some sort of like pure water, I totally like tap water. I boil um, and then let it cool, then add my vodka and add my honey. And um, that's actually my preferred method of doing things. I see fermentation in, you know, complete fermentation in three to four days. Oh, wow. Um, there's yeah there's just so much uh there's so much yeast and bacteria in that honey it really likes to get going and um you know there's this idea that the the yeast and bacteria that are on or in a certain fruit flower honey what have you are going to be uniquely um uniquely capable of fermenting that sugar source hmm. so you know in in the wine world when you're pressing those grapes and you're doing a natural fermentation the yeast that are found on the skins of those grapes are said to be, you know, the best suited for fermenting that sugar source. So all of the starter methods that involve honey or stuff that bees may come in contact with are really, they're really fast to ferment. Uh, they, they taste like honey. They taste like flowers. Um, so it's just a, a nice little shorthand to like, oh, things that, that have honey or bees, really great fermenters of honey. So... Now, when you naturally ferment uh, wine or cider, uh, you don't want a sour product, obviously. <laughs> you know, correct? Yeah. Uh, do you? What's the character of the of the final product that you get from these processes? Uh, so it kind of varies. This is actually a great way to move into the the method that I call the whole volume must. Um, that is kind of a very different process where you're just taking the total amount of honey you're going to add and diluting that into the water to to reach your full volume or your gravity and so you're not really making a starter per se you, the kind of the ferment itself is its starter and in this method you see a pretty slow yeast growth and so you get some of that like lactic acid character right up front because it's it's not the same as say kettle souring because you do have yeast in there but it's that lag phase of the yeast starting to ferment allows the lactic acid bacteria and anything else in there to kind of produce some funkier flavors. Huh. So the ones I've done in the whole volume method have come out sour, tart. Um, they've been kind of spicy tasting. You get sort of the yeast and the bacteria, you know, those flavors are up front. Whereas something like the honey starter method, where you're kind of pre-selecting the yeast that are already in that honey gives you very floral, kind of fruity, very honey forward taste. Huh. And and just to clarify, uh, you are not exposing. Uh, your goal is not to to get uh, organisms from the air as you would in in doing kind of a lambic style uh, fermentation. Your goal is to. Uh, concentrate on the on the organisms that are already in the honey. So I'm assuming that you know when you dilute this uh, this must, you put it in a sealed, you know, with an airlock uh, yeah. uh, container, right so into a carboy. So you're keeping it away yep. from the air. Yeah, absolutely. So you're you're totally right. I'm trying to sort of select one source of yeast and and go with that. But I do on my list <clears throat> is like a spontaneous capture or an environmental capture where you just like a little cool ship or just like you may sample yeast from an environment in, in beer making, I'm taking that starter, I'm bringing it out into the woods or into my yard. Mm -hmm. I'm putting like a rough screen over it and letting it sit out overnight. Um, so I have done that with meads too. Um, and it sort of, it mimics the kind of qualities you'd expect in like a Lambic or a beer like that. You're getting, um, those really yeast forward flavors. You're getting some of that tartness. Um, 
And it, I, I don't know. That's one of my favorite ways to do it. I just think it's so crazy to sit a <laughs> jar out overnight and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. uh, it goes against everything that uh, that you you know are taught when you <laughs> when you're becoming a home brewer. <laughs> it's just yeah, like, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It's just sticking a, a certain finger up to the <laughs> the rules. I know. I think that's kind of <laughs> why I like it. It's like it feels almost like. You know, we do so much work with adding the lactic acid, adding the vodka to make it perfectly safe. Um, but, you know, there's something like, ooh, this is this goes against convention or, ooh, this may be, you know, a little bit riskier. Um, that's kind of fun. Now, it, it, it's not I would, I would assume since you're t- you're adding the alcohol, you're adding the acid, it's not, quote unquote, risky as far as from a health or a safety concern, right? It's it's more about yeah. the character of the of the organisms that you're trying to collect or you're going to collect. Yeah, the risk involved is the risk of producing a bad product, not the risk of making yourself ill. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it. I would. I wouldn't be doing my part if I didn't mention just basic safety things when doing this sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So when you're creating a starter like this, or when you're creating a product um, with wild fermentation before you're sampling it or tasting it, you definitely want to make sure that it looks and it smells like the product you're trying to produce, whether that be beer or mead. Um, if you if you have a pellicle on it, it should be white, tan, gray. It shouldn't be colored at all. If it's colored at all or you see mold, that's definitely time to dump it. Um, and if you have the ability to you know, take a pH reading, under 4.5 is generally considered safe. And before sampling it, also just measure attenuation, see if it actually fermented. You want something that's fermented and above uh, about 4%, you know, pH below 4.5, no crazy colors and smells and looks like what it's supposed to be. It should be totally safe. And anytime we talk about this kind of thing or or going out and, you know, picking, uh, you know, foraging for, for ingredients or anything like that, I like to say legal disclaimer do lots of research, <laughs> you yeah. know, make, <laughs> make sure and do your reading because, you know, there is a possibility that, you know, uh, if you do something wrong, you know, you could make yourself sick. So uh, we yeah, want to make sure that people take care of themselves. Yeah. And I, it's funny because I, I do a lot of foraging as well and I incorporate that in my mead making and I'm like the most worried person when it comes to that sort of stuff. And so there's so much great knowledge out there that you can look at and really shows you what's safe and what isn't and, and the great, great ways of doing it. So like I said, Sui Generis Brewing um, is a great place to start. He's, I believe, a microbiologist. And so he really goes deep into, you know, what's safe, what isn't, what's the best way of doing things. Um, and that's mostly about beer making, but he does have a wild mead video out there. So if you're interested in that, check it out. There you go. Now with these spontaneous captures, have you captured stuff that doesn't taste good? <laughs> have you have you thrown the, have you thrown anything away? Yeah, it's it's definitely worth mentioning that um, if you're doing. I mean, I see a pretty good success rate, but there's definitely times that I've had like, wow, this smells like I've just opened a can of olives. Ooh. Not necessarily bad as <laughs> like a you know uh, bilious or you know body odor smell or taste, but like. Something I'm like, I don't think I'm going to pursue this further with a mead. Um, but yeah, usually what I do is I, I get my I get my sort of spontaneous capture. I let it ferment for about a month. And then, you know, through that process, I'm I'm assessing it. And then at that point is kind of where I call it. You don't want to do any of your tasting and stuff, you know, before a month because um, you got to give time for the yeast to ferment everything, drop the acidity, all that. Um but yeah, I kind of assess after a month and go like, "Oh, this isn't <laughs> what I was looking for." <laughs> but every now and then you get you come up with a winner. Yeah, absolutely. And they're really it's it's a lot of fun when you do. You feel very connected to the place that you you get your yeast from. I did the one the first one I did, I I bought yeast from this cool property we have here in Burlington uh that's open to the public, but they they've got like a little farm, they've got like a little uh, beekeeping operation. So I got yeast from there. I mean, I got, I got honey from there and then I went out and stuck a jar out under a tree from the same property. Mm. And so everything that I had, um, you know, used to make that meat, including some forage blackberries was coming from that one, one slice of property. How long do you have to set the, uh, 
set the container out uh, to, to do your initial capture? Yeah, so I usually go overnight about 12 hours, um, and I'm doing that at times of the year when the temperature overnight is kind of just above freezing. So 35 to 40 degrees um, is ideal. Hmm. And do you put any kind of screen over the over the container uh, to let the microbes come in and the bugs, the true bugs, <laughs> stay out? <laughs> um. So I do and I don't. It kind of depends where I'm putting it. If I'm putting it in a, in a place where I think there might be, you know, larger animals, I'm not as concerned about the bugs as uh, fruit flies and stuff like that. Like bugs actually are a really great source of yeast and bacteria. Hmm. Um, it is a little bit gross at first, but when you kind of step that starter up or if you move it into, you know, it, it kind of gets less gross as you don't see bugs floating around in it. Um <laughs> But I'm more concerned about keeping things like cats or raccoons and stuff out of it. Um, so I do have like a I do have like a larger mesh screen that I put over the top. <laughs> this meat tastes a little like raccoon spit. <laughs> yeah, no. Love my cat. Don't really want to make cat meat. <laughs> <laughs> don't see that on the Groenfell website anytime soon. Now, does Ricky, you know, he knows you're playing with these wild things, you know, does is he nervous about you, uh, you know, walking through his uh, his brewery, his uh, meadery? Well, I actually haven't told him I'm going to be on this podcast yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, he knows I'm the yeast guy. He knows I'm super into this, but I was like, my plan was to surprise him with this <laughs> so ricky and kelly former sponsors of basic brewing radio <laughs> <laughs> no he knows all the work i'm doing with wild yeast and and how i think it's super cool and stuff i just he knows that i've been doing these projects um i just didn't go that last step of saying hey I reached out to James. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll be cool with it. Plus, he's distracted because uh, he and Kelly are, are about to welcome another member to the family. So, uh, yeah, we're happy about that. I, you know, I've, I've I've been doing this for so long. You know, there there have been two or three uh, uh, family members of the podcast. I, I like to say, but uh, two of our our extended Basic Brewing Radio family are are expecting. So it's very exciting. Yeah, uh, Rick and Kelly. And it's then, it's so cool. And yeah, then, it's, and then Casey and exciting. Casey and Casey and Dorothy over at Ivory Bill are about ready to have one. So it's like, uh, you know, it. I, I feel old. I guess is what <laughs> I've seen people grow up while doing this thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny too because they're Nora. Their first like when I started working there full time, we there was a staff of four or five. And so we were basically, you know, hanging out like a family or like babysitting Nora when Ricky or Kelly had to go to a really important meeting. So it, it's just mind boggling to think that, you know, it's been a few years I've been there and, you know, they've got another on the way. <laughs> Sunrise, sunset. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a quick break from talking about mead to talk about mead. Jake's boss, Ricky, at Gronfell Meadery in Vermont, says the ancient collection is going to be back in permanent rotation starting April 16th. Uh, you may remember the ancient collection, three delicious meads, stronger than the usual fare at Gronfell, and uh, and Havoc uh, in collectible ceramic bottles. There's Brag Eye, which is honey, Black currants, elderflowers, rose hips, and a touch of juniper berry. Mmm. Hegir, European cherries blended with wildflower honey aged on cherry wood. And veneer, wildflower honey fermented on three European strains of yeast aged on carved ash wood and oak. So, we know what Jake's going to be doing. <laughs> Uh, Ricky says it's the same ingredients as the previous batch of Ancient Collection with a new brewing process. Very interesting. Uh, over the most of the country, you can order the Ancient Collection starting April 16th, along with other, the, all the other deliciously sessionable craft honey beverages from Gronfell and Havoc at Gronfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. So we've done honey-based yeast starter. 
Uh, we've done mm-hmm. spontaneous capture starter. We've done whole volume must. We've done pre-fermented honey. That's where we, we started. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the object uh, or the, the last uh, uh, on the list is object yeast capture. So what is, what is object yes. yeast cap- capture? So that is sort of uh, what I think a lot of people think of when they're thinking of a wild yeast starter. It's kind of where you're taking that uh, starter mixture that I described and you're going out into the environment and you're going, oh, hey, like these flowers are blossoming. I'm going to pick a couple of those and stick it in my jar. Um, You know, stuff like that where you're literally taking an object from the environment that is going to be covered in yeast and you're putting it into your, your mixture and letting that ferment. So I've done that with beeswax and pollen, as well as stuff like pine needles or flowers. Hmm. Um, and it's super easy to do. You obviously, you want to make sure your hands are clean or whatever you're using to pick. You don't want to influence the bugs that are getting into your starter, but you know, um, tree like deciduous tree barks and leaves have a bunch of yeast on them. Um, flowers, like I said, berries, fruits, anything like that, um, is a good, great source. And uh, I, I'm assuming there are some safety rules that you got to follow with that. I would assume that you wouldn't want to pick stuff off off the the forest floor. Uh, yeah. Know, off the so ground. when I'm saying leaves, I mean like you know on the tree. You don't want stuff um, from the ground. In fact, I mean it's a great source. Yeast actually originated in sort of that yeast uh, leaf litter, but it is the most dangerous thing you could kind of culture from there's there's a lot of pathogens there's a lot of enteric bacteria and stuff that could make you sick so um i would just completely avoid that mm-hmm. i mean you can you can kind of go almost any fruit or flower that you could eat and stick it in that starter and what you want to do is take it out like take that material out after about 24 hours mm. um it's when you kind of were mentioning, oh, maybe, you know, there's some safety things to consider. This is the one where you want to be really uh, diligent about checking for mold and stuff like that, because all those little pieces of pine needles or flowers that can float up to the top of your starter uh, and be exposed to oxygen, that's where, you know, molds are going to take hold. So 24 hours, keep your keep your material in there, kind of keep it uh, submerged if you can, and then strain it out after that 24 hours is up. Yeah, let's talk about oxygen. I mean, do you want to? I'm assuming that, like, with the with the whole must, uh, whole volume must approach, you would want to aerate your wort uh, to to provide for a good fermentation, uh, right or wrong? Uh, yeah, I I do that. I do basically the sort of like carboy shaking, um, or you know, just kind of stirring things up. Mm -hmm. daily until I'm seeing activity. So I wake up, I kind of give everything a check. I kind of shake everything up, stir it around. I don't have airlocks on, um, things that are straight up starters at this point. Uh, things that I'm trying to encourage oxygen to get into air, no airlocks until I'm seeing activity. At that point, I will put an airlock on it. You, if you're before the point of seeing activity, you can keep like a coffee filter, something that's going to breathe a little bit, um, but keep bugs out. Because mm. once you've selected the yeast you're trying to grow, you don't want other sources getting in there and contaminating it. So, yeah, something breathable, paper towel, coffee filter. Um, if you've got a screen, like a mason jar lid screen, you can use that. Um, but once you start seeing a little bubbling, you start smelling fermentation, you know, stick an airlock on it and continue to shake and degas. But, you know, at that point, you'll have enough oxygen. So how how long from start to finish uh, can you expect to to see uh, a finished product? And also, do these yeasts are they? I guess it varies whether you're looking for a finished gravity or, or the finished gravities of these wild yeasts are they higher or lower uh, than you know standard commercial yeasts? There's a lot of questions um, in there. <laughs> no, yeah. So I'll, I'll start some. with sort of the time frame for, for each method. Um, so the ones that are directly involving honey, um, and I'm making a starter, so that being the honey starter, um, and if you're doing an object capture with, say, beeswax or, or pollen, um, 
those two ferment super quickly. I usually see three to four days totally dry. I mean, I'm starting at a potential alcohol in that starter of about 5%, ah. but I already have about 5% alcohol in that starter. So that is selecting for those highly fermentative yeasts that can most likely get you up to 10 or 12%. Um, for things like the, the whole must, I'm seeing activity in three to four days, and I'm seeing kind of a longer drawn out fermentation time of two to three weeks. For the spontaneous or environmental captures, um, I'm seeing activity again in, in two to three, maybe four days, and then a slower fermentation of two to three weeks. Um, and then if you're doing the pre-fermented honey, that's going to definitely be your slowest method. I, I see activity at about a month. Um, at that point, you can then dilute it down to your whole volume or your uh, chosen gravity. I'm still seeing it go dry, but it's taking a month, you know. Um, well, still, and still with the, the, you know, on, on, uh, uh, you know, traditional, uh, yeast or traditional mead timelines, that's still pretty quick. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the knowledge about mead has kind of been expanding and the, the, uh, importance of yeast nutrients has really, has really come to the forefront. So, um, you know, my standard mead making procedure includes, uh, you know, nutrient additions, and so that kind of goes without saying here, you want to, you're growing yeast up from small numbers from, you know, not domesticated or not like lab grown yeast. So you want to give them the best environment you can. So definitely use nutrient that use go firm or energizer. Um, you really want success here. So do everything you can to give your yeast your best shot. And the, the second part of that, uh, <laughs> extended mess of a question was, uh, final gravities and and then you you know you work in alcohol tolerance in there as well mm -hmm. yeah i see all almost all of these if done uh properly go completely dry mm. um and because we are selecting for highly fermentative yeast i'm usually doing these between 10 and 12 percent mm. um and they get there no problem if you're if you're using those uh nutrient additions like mentioned um, but yeah, I was, I've kind of been really surprised by that. You know, I, when I first started working with interns and stuff at Grunfell and we were talking about wild yeast or, or stuff like that, I'd be like, well, you know, you can do it, you know, you'll probably be lucky if you get to up to 8% and routinely, you know, we'd do it and it would be like, oh, this, this made it up to 15%. Like <laughs> what? Um, I had a friend who who started working there and she is a beekeeper. And so she came home with this jug of honey and I took a gravity reading after we had mixed it with some water. She's like, it tastes really good like this. Like this is where I kind of want it, this level of sweetness. And I was like, well, you're at a potential uh, of 15% of and you want to do wild yeast. So like you'll probably get up to eight. And it, it was like two weeks later, you know, we, we used our nutrient addition schedule uh, and she got up to 15% and was like, it's not really what I was expecting. I wanted something sweet. I love honey, but it's great. It's, it's very alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, how, so, yeah. Dr how drinkable, uh, was that? And, and did you back sweeten it? Um, we did not back sweeten it. Uh, she is very much in the sort of like natural vein, um, of not wanting to kind of doctor things too much. And that's usually how I'm feeling too. I, I think, they spend a lot of time kind of capturing these yeasts and trying to express the environment. I'm, I'm trying not to add additives uh, like sulfite or sorbate if I don't have to. Mm -hmm. If I'm really looking to, if I'm, I'm working with like a really cool honey, like not weed honey or something like that, and I want that character to come through at the end, um, at that point, you know, sulfite sorbate, back sweeten um, is a great way to go. But that 15% that one was not back sweetened. And to her credit, it didn't, you know, it drank hot, but it didn't drink like 15%. It was still quite nice. Huh. And I imagine you could flavor it at time of serving, you know, with some syrups or something like that if you really yeah. wanted to cut it a little bit. Um, Absolutely. And I think I think when you're, like I mentioned earlier, when you're working with yeasts coming from honey, uh, you know, those are sort of the ones that are best suited to dealing with those, you know, high sugar environments. I mean, they've been sitting in... Yeah, what is it like? Almost eighty-two percent 
sugar mm-hmm. like for you know as long as they they have like years um if you can kind of rouse them and get them back up and and working you know they're they're like oh yeah we've been sitting in 82 percent <laughs> sugar for for a long time this is 20 percent sugar i can i can handle that <laughs> so they go they go quickly and they go they go up to you know high abvs so have you repitched any of these uh, these yeasts that you've collected could you uh, say, you know, rack your one batch of mead off and, and put another must on top of it. I imagine it would take off like a rocket if you did that. Yeah, I have done that. And uh, it does. It does take off like a rocket. Um, I there There's ones that, you know, you really, you really like and you want to keep using and you can kind of keep using that method or you can mix it with like a 40% uh, glycerin solution and freeze it. Um, and yeah, the repitching thing has really has really worked out. I've only gone, I think, like three or four generations out. I haven't seen much drift in terms of flavor mm. or aroma. Um, but typically, the ones that I'm I'm saving and reusing are either ones that I I really like the character of the initial capture. So like ones like that where I was talking about getting it from doing a mead from a single piece of property. Um, that's just such a cool idea to me. I save that one and reuse it a couple times, but more often than not, I'm using, uh, I'm using pitches from the honey starter method. I think that's my kind of go-to now. I see a quick enough, uh, fermentation and I see really solid results with it, you know, success rates that are really favorable. So that's that's what I typically use, and I'll typically repitch off of those. The object captures I find they drift a little bit more, hmm. um, and they're a little bit like, eh, is this good? Is this not? And same thing with the spontaneous. Um, the pre fermented honey is kind of weird. I I don't know if you're fermenting the honey how you would kind of reuse that. Um, plus, it's not my favorite flavor profile. You get some really interesting. Uh, flavors when it comes to honey and mead like it gets nutty Hmm. it gets uh kind of complex but once you diluted it down to its final uh gravity it's kind of flat tasting it's a little bit as steve would say i believe flabby Uh, um so so you get those like really crazy like you're like oh this smells like almonds or or walnuts but then which is cool and then you dilute it and you're like it's kind of just missing a little acidity it's kind of missing something so um, and, yeah. I'm, and I imagine part part of it is is that you is the fun of discovery. You know, if you if you're just reusing something that you've already done, it's kind of the you know my attention span as far as brewing is is pretty narrow. In that I don't I don't rebrew a lot of batches. <laughs> you know, yeah. If I do rebrew a, a recipe, I'll I'll tweak it or take it another direction because you know I've already had. Uh, the beer that, you know, I don't want to brew another one just like the one I'd brewed before, usually, you know, because it's part of the the homebrew adventure. You know, you want to try something new and, and it's sort of the surprise of what comes at the end. That's that's fun for me. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm exactly the same way. I my beer brewing setup is is a two gallon system and I've got one of those little uh, like cannonball kegs that I keep in my fridge. So every week or two, I'm brewing something totally new. And then I've got that on tap in my fridge for, for the week. And then, you know, trying something new after that. And so when I am reusing, it's sort of, uh, in situations where I know that like I need to be successful. So say I've got a friend who's like, Hey, I've got this really cool honey, like really unique, really crazy stuff. Like you got to try in a mead. And I'm like, okay, I, I know I want this to work out because I want to taste what this honey tastes like as a mead. Or I've been out foraging and I'm like, oh my gosh, I found this huge crop of blackberries. You know, I really want this to work out. That's when I'll kind of pick out a culture that I've, I know works and I won't really take that risk. But yeah, it's so fun to just try and figure out what flavors and aromas and stuff you can get from all these different captures. It's, it's fascinating. Wow. Well, it's inspiring to hear you uh, talk about all this, and and uh, it's something that you know I know a, a local beekeeper, uh, and it would be really fun to do a little you know small batch of you know locally naturally wild fermented mead just as you know just to see what happens. 
So is do yeah. you do you have a resource uh, or have you written anything anywhere where people can uh, can you know get more information? Uh, I personally haven't. I have an Instagram uh, that I made when I wasn't brewing as much during COVID. I was like, I need an outlet to like let's post some stuff um, that I'm gonna kind of be posting these different trials and stuff on. That's Second Nature Ferments. Um, but again, I'd really point people towards the sui generis uh, brewing YouTube videos. I kind of took a lot of that information that's geared towards beer and just applied it to the mead making background that I have. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, it's such a great, such a great resource and this guy's a really knowledgeable guy. Like I said, he works as a microbiologist. So if safety is a concern, um, if you're really looking to go deeper than I can provide information for, like, you know, lab work stuff, like looking at things under a microscope, like there's all that information out there. Milk the Funk has a bunch of cool information. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I haven't I haven't personally written anything on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, excellent. You've you, but you've you've done a, a great service here by you know introducing us to the to the topic, uh, and uh, I'm I'm hoping that uh, people will be inspired and and try some new stuff themselves. Absolutely, yeah, and I I hope it all makes sense to them. I'm I feel like I'm a bit of a rambler, so you know as long as they can glean some. Uh, glean some some little nuggets of knowledge out of this i'll be happy you done good it, it makes sense <laughs> to me and if it makes sense to me then you know it's you're you, <laughs> you've reached <laughs> reached a good level well jake this has been fun Great. uh give give all my best to to everybody at uh, at gronfell and and havoc and uh you know I, I hope our paths will cross more than virtually again in the future me too, James. I really appreciate it. And I, I would like to say a giant thank you to you and Steve. You guys have really inspired me, uh, really given us such good information. Just the homebrewing community, I think, is, is really grateful for you guys. So thank you, James. Well, thanks again to Jake. I hope that uh, Ricky and Kelly were pleasantly surprised this week. <laughs> All the best uh, for the arrival of the new addition to the family coming up soon. And the same to Casey and Dorothy over at uh, Ivory Bill. We're very close as well. So excited. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.